So welcome to the translation um, part of chapter 14. We are going to do a quick recap of the slides that go with the new Campbell textbook in January 2014. You've been asked to watch some screencasts that were made and you will continue to be asked to watch them um, from the previous version of the textbook and um, it's because some of this stuff hasn't changed. Figures are pretty similar and uh, that gives me a chance to record other ones instead. So I just wanted to give you a quick recap just to make sure you look at some of the figures that we have here. Here's a summary of the whole chapter. So you should have already um, watched the um, transcription which is where DNA gets turned into mRNA. RNA polymerase finds the gene and starts copying it into mRNA. We'll talk a lot more about gene expression in the next chapter, chapter 15. That RNA needs to get processed. We need to um, remove the introns, add a poly A tail. They don't have it over here, but they have it over here, 5-methyl G-cap, which tells this mRNA that belongs out here and also plays a role in protecting it for its um, stability in the cytoplasm. We're going to focus in this screencast in a minute or two on the next steps where we turn that mRNA into a growing peptide chain, get, chain and get through all these little important pieces of information. So, um, like I said, it's very important that DNA gets um, trans transcribed into pre-mRNA, which is a larger piece of nucleic acid. Again, the U gets um, added in instead of a T that was in the DNA, and then the RNA will get processed. Um, let me just skip over that. The code, we spent a lot of time talking about the code. Um, you need to be able to read this and understand that this is the first of the three codons. That's the second base and that's the third base. And remember, we're reading this in U's, so that means that we are reading this in the RNA. And uh, you heard a lot of information about the code. I love this picture because it reminds you that the code is universal. I know we've said this before, but it, it bears repeating. It evolved once, probably. The same genes that use the code in bacteria can be using the code in, uh, in pigs and in plants. And what they're showing you here is they take a firefly gene, probably luciferase, and they're expressing it in a tobacco plant, meaning that the plant reads the code on the firefly gene and knows exactly what and translates it perfectly. In this case, it's a pig expressing the green fluorescent protein that's from a jellyfish. We will be using that in our experiments very soon. Um, it, when it has a certain wavelength hit it, it glows kind of a yellowish green. So this is just many, uh, one of many different examples of how the code is universal. Different species can read it. It's pretty fascinating. There's only a few examples of um, changes that have happened in the code, and that's a very species-specific thing. Um, again, you make your RNA transcript as a copy of the DNA. Anything um, can be copied from the DNA. This would be called a gene. We'll talk a lot more about those promoters and how the RNA polymerase gets directed there. Move through here. Um, and then just a quick piece of information about RNA processing. So the pre-mRNA has these untranslated regions, introns in them. Um, the red, the dark red, are the the mRNA sequences that will become the um, triplet code and be read by the ribosome. So it turns out that there's only 146 amino acids here, so 146 times 3. No, I'm sorry, 146 divided by 3 would be the number of amino acids here. And um, as it gets processed, we put on the cap and the tail. The spliceosome is in the nucleus. There are um, these little small RNAs, they're called SNRPs, small nuclear ribonuclear proteins because they associate with a protein. They um, hydrogen bond or complementary base pair with a few bases on the intron side and then they direct the cutting and pasting of those exons together. Um, interesting that you cannot predict if you have a processed mRNA, which um, sometimes we call a cDNA, if you're moving it around in the lab, we'll get into that very soon, um, you can't tell where that splice boundary is. And it's a pretty uh, interesting set of experiments that people have to do to try to figure that out. 
Okay, let's move on to today's topic, which is translation. So here are all the major players. We have the ribosome, which is made up of both ribosomal RNA and protein. You'll see a structure of that in a minute. We have tRNA, which is the piece of RNA. There's many different kinds of RNA you're learning now, especially that um, this tRNA has a special anticodon, which is complementary to the mRNA, and it um, this one denotes a glycine, so it matches the glycine codon, and it brings along the glycine amino acid, which will then get attached to that growing polypeptide. And then we, of course, have the mRNA, which is the information that the ribosome is reading. So let's look a little bit more at the structure of the tRNA. Um, you'll see all different orientations of it. It was uh, named tRNA mostly uh, for two reasons. It transfers RNA. Um, amino acids and it also kind of has a T shape. When they um, did the 3D structure with crystallography they found out it's a little bit more like a upside down L but nonetheless um, it's a it's an interesting structure. So normally RNA as you think of as linear, tRNA can hydrogen bond that C is attracted to the G and so on and make a superstructure. It's part of the way that um, RNAs can become catalytic. They can fold up into different structures and do different jobs. In this case, the job of this tRNA is to deliver the amino acid. So it has the anticodon site, which if you read it, 5 prime to 3 prime is going to be complementary to the mRNA. mRNA would be U, U, C, that it would be binding. That anticodon is the opposite, so it's the complementary, it's on the bottom, and on the top is where at the three prime end you attach an amino acid. They tend to use this abbreviated block structure in our textbook. So how does that tRNA get its amino acid? Well there are 20 different en enzymes called tyrosyl tRNA synthetase. Um, don't worry about it so much the name of it, just know that there's an enzyme that very specifically fits in a special tRNA, so its anticodon matches up down here, and then it designates that that's the uh, amino acid that gets added. So this is called tyrosyl tRNA synthetase because it's be going to add the amino acid tyrosine that fits just in there. Uses up energy to do this, so there's a lot of energy that goes invo uh, that's involved with making a protein. Every single amino acid has to get charged, that's how they say it, on this tRNA, and then when we make the bonds, um, GTP gets used. So every time you add an amino acid to um, a growing peptide chain, you're using up several um, bonds of ATP or GTP, so lots of energy. So here's the anatomy of the, um, the 3D structure of the ribosome, the small subunits on the bottom here, large subunits on the top. Um, then it has these little sections in here that correspond to where the different um, tRNAs combined. Ultimately, it's reading and matching up to the codons in the mRNA that kind of processes through here. And um, the A site um, is the amino acyl tRNA binding site, or you might want to think of it as an acceptor site. The P site is where the growing peptide chain is, so that's sort of the position number two. Um, the tRNA comes into position A, bringing its new amino acid that matches the codon here. A bond gets made between these two, and then everything is on the P site. The E site, exit site, it doesn't really bind the mRNA here at this point anymore, you can see, and that's where that uncharged tRNA is going to be leaving. So here's a, a nice little, uh, we'll, we'll watch an animation, but here's like a schematic of what happens. So we have the, again, the new tRNA with an amino acid comes into the A site, use GTP to make this bond, peptide bond. Now this guy, P, is empty. We use GTP to move everybody over. The ribosome literally bounces down the mRNA. And then um, the growing chain is now on that A. The E leaves. And then we start over again. How does it all... Oh, that didn't show how it starts. Mm. I feel like there's a slide missing. Let's go back to this one for a second. How does this... Uh, guy gets started, it actually um, is not put together as a large and small subunit. It turns out that as the mRNA comes out into the cytoplasm, the small subunit scans the mRNA for an AUG, which is the first 
codon that is always looked for. There's an experiment in the textbook that we're going to do a mastering biology on which shows you how the RNA uh, small subunit sort of scans the mRNA and has a, a cognate sequence they call it or a, a a conserved sequence that it searches for to know that the next AUG is the methionine it should use. Um, and then the large subunit attaches on top. So once that happens, we go through the rounds of elongation. And then finally you have to stop. Um, there is the stop codons. Remember we, we saw those in the code. They bind what's called a release factor, which basically says, hey, we're done. It catalyzes the release of that polypeptide from the ribosome. Everything falls apart. You need some energy to do all that. And now you have a protein ready. If this happened to the cytoplasm, it's going to fold up and go do its job. Now, we know that there are quite a few proteins that need to go into the ER and then into the Golgi and then get sorted to go on to their final destination. That's going to happen if it's a a soluble protein that maybe is going to go to, say, a lysosome or be secreted from the cell or if it stays tethered in the membrane. Either one of those options. If you go to the ER, you have to be targeted this way. So here we got our mRNA attached to our ribosome. We have um, between 12 and 18 amino acids starting to be made and just enough to span the large subunit and kind of have a little bit hanging out. So this first part, this green couple of amino acids are called the signal peptide. And again, this is another that's called a cognate sequence. So there's a, it's not a definite uh, pattern, uh, exact amino acids, but there's a pattern to it. And that pattern of charged and uncharged um, amino acids binds the signal recognition particle. So signal recognition particle is a protein swimming around in the cytoplasm. And if it bumps into a signal peptide that's coming out of a ribosome, it basically drags the whole complex over to the uh, docking complex. It's called the translocation complex. So signal recognition particle docks, and now it starts to spew that protein into the ER. A lot of times the signal recognition particle gets clipped off so um, you don't see it in the final product. So now these amino these proteins will not have a methionine on their on their end terminus or on their edge. Methionine is the first amino acid that is always coded for in the mRNA. So sometimes you'll know whether your protein went through the ER or not by whether it has a methionine on the top or not. Then these proteins continue to fold in the ER and get processed through. It's just to show you that, um, remember, bacteria do not um, process their RNA. They make it, they copy it, they, they transcribe it, and then they translate it immediately. So you can have a complex of um, uh, many um, ribosomes attached to an mRNA, and in fact, that mRNA may even be attached to an mRNA polymerase that's spewing out the RNA as you go. Uh, remember, bacteria have a pretty quick life cycle usually, so they need to be making their proteins fairly quickly, and this is one way that they can make a lot for um, in a short amount of time. I think I will leave the discussion of mutations to the previous version of um, the screencast. Um, it's all the same stuff. You'll just um, see these figures in our book, slightly different colored figures in the other book, but no big deal. <laughs>